en, haciendo en los, en los tres puntitos, haciendo clic, ahí pueden seleccionar si quieren escucharlo en español. Thank you very much. And we'll just give everyone uh, a few seconds to click icons and uh, switch over to uh, their preferred channel. And in the meantime, uh, we'll take uh, just a minute or two to uh, just finish a couple more housekeeping items. The presentation is scheduled for about an hour, which will be followed by about 30 minutes of uh, question and answer. You can submit your question via the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen at any time during the presentation or during the Q&A. So uh, for those of you who uh, this might be your first encounter with the Sonoma Land Trust, uh, the Land Trust is a local nonprofit that protects the land in Sonoma County for everyone's benefit. We've been doing this work since 1976, and we've protected uh, nearly 58,000 acres in our county so far. Uh, we accomplish our work through the generosity and the support of our members and contributors. So many of you out there are exactly in that category. And we wanna say thanks to all of you, especially for helping us protect this incredible place, this Sonoma County that we call home, not just for now, but for future generations. Uh, as we pursue our mission of conserving land in Sonoma County, we recognize that we stand on the unceded ancestral lands of many indigenous peoples uh, in this area. We honor their knowledge, their care, and their stewardship of this very special place across the ages and acknowledge the deep and lasting damage that colonization has inflicted on them. We embrace our responsibility to learn from and protect their cultural and traditional connections to the land. So today we're going to dive deeper into California's plan to tackle the existential crises of climate disruption and mass species extinction. This is an unprecedented goal to protect 30% of California's landscape and ecosystems by the end of the decade. One of the reasons why it's unprecedented is that unlike some of the grand environmental aspirations of the past, this one actually has funding behind it. To find out more about what 3030 is intended to achieve, uh, how and by whom it's being shaped, and what it could mean for the future of our state, we have two experts in the field of California environmental policy here with us tonight. Uh, and they'll walk us through the highlights of what we all hope will be a turning point for the natural world in one of the world's most threatened biodiversity hotspots. I'd like to start with introducing our good friend and go-to expert, Kim Delfino. Kim is the founder and president of Earth Advocacy, a consulting company that provides policy and ag ag <coughs> advocacy guidance to nonprofits and foundations that have the goal of protecting and restoring our lands, water, and wildlife for future generations. Previously, she served as the longtime California Director of Defenders of Wildlife. She developed and directed the organization's work across the state, including determining policy and program work in wildlife, land use, water, and energy issues. Her policy expertise lies in state and federal endangered species, land use planning, water uh, uh, planning, and other natural resource laws. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree in political science and uh, public service with an environmental policy emphasis from the University of California, Davis. Go Aggies! And she earned her law degree in 1993 from the McGeorge School of Law. 
Uh, next is our own Ariana Rickard, uh, who is the Public Policy and Funding Program Manager at Sonoma Land Trust. Ariana is the face of the Land Trust in Sacramento and works with state and federal agencies and legislators to ensure that the Sonoma Land Trust programs and projects receive adequate funding and support. Her experience in advocacy stems from her time as political director at Together Bay Area and with the San Francisco Bay Joint Venture. Ariana has also worked for several federal government agencies, including the Peace Corps in Ecuador and numerous environmental projects such as Audubon, California. Uh, she earned her uh, bachelor's degree from Harvard College in environmental science and public policy and her master's in science from the University of Michigan and Arbor with a focus on ecology. In 2020, she co-founded the Bay Area chapter of Environmental Professionals of Color to increase equity, diversity, and inclusion in the Bay Area's environmental community. So I think you'll agree we've got some, some heavy hitters to, to, to talk to you to that tonight. So I'd like to turn it over to Kim, who'll begin tonight's webinar with a, a run through of just what is 30 by 30. Over to you, Kim. Thank you, Eamon. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to, uh, Ariana, great, just bring up the slides and I'll get started. Um, maybe to the next slide. So I'm here to tell you sort of the, the story of why we have 30 by 30. Um, Ariana and I are going to go back and forth in this presentation. Um, so Nature, as uh, Eamon has already described it, is um, nature around the world is in a state of crisis. Um, it's threatening the planet and humanity. Uh, beginning in 2000, experts around the country, more than 300 of them, guided by a 60-member federal advisory body, issued what was known as the National Climate Assessment. And in this assessment, these experts have or tell us what's happening to our climate, what we can expect to happen in the future, if we act quickly, or what can happen if we don't act at all. And this assessment is updated every several years. And in the most recent national climate assessment that was issued in 2018, the scientists stated that climate change is reducing the ability of ecosystems, or in other words, our forests, our oceans, grasslands, lakes, rivers, and streams to protect us from natural disasters and to provide clean air clean water and food. One year later, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is kind of a mouthful, the IPBES, which you see the cover of it here on the screen, found that approximately 1 million plant and animal species are threatened with extinction over the coming decades. As a result of human impacts, and that extinction, the crisis is both fueling the worst impacts of climate change and is fueled by climate change itself. And according to these leading scientists, the loss of biodiversity or the loss of the abundance and diversity of species, bugs, birds, animals, plants, et cetera, threatens every being on the planet, including humans, thereby making the loss of biodiversity not only an environmental problem, but a developmental, economic, security, social, and moral issue. Next slide. This was confirmed in the most recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or known as the IPCC report, which was released last month. The IPCC is the United Nation body for assessing all of the science associated with climate change. And in this report, the scientists state that biodiversity loss is accelerating as, um, as are the impacts from climate change. And we see it, we see it here in California with drought, fire, flooding, and other natural disasters. The experts also stated that safeguarding and strengthening nature is a key to securing a livable future. And in other words, biodiversity protection is a climate solution. Next slide. In April of 2019, 
19 leading scientists authored a paper entitled The Global Deal for Nature. This is a time-bound science-driven plan to save the diversity and abundance of life on Earth through a step-down goal to protect 30% of the planet by 2030. And in fact, it's actually rooted in a proposition by a very famous science, uh, conservation biology scientist, uh, E.O. Wilson, who unfortunately just recently passed. His proposition was that in order to save humanity, we must protect 50% of the planet by 2050. But in order to achieve a more reachable goal, we, we are stepping it down to 30% by 2030. So science is telling us that it is critical to protect 30% of our lands and waters by 2030 to have any hope of avoiding the worst impacts of climate change and reversing the extinction crisis. Climate and biodiversity are closely intertwined. We have to have functioning ecosystems to become more resilient to the impacts of climate change. We must stop the loss of biodiversity to ensure resilient ecosystems. Next slide. So here's a map that the Global Deal for Nature paper put forward. And I'm gonna explain how, how to read this here. So the dark green areas are what the scientists have projected are already protected. The light green areas are the areas in which we have the highest potential for protection and are the least impacted. Um, the yellow areas are moderately impacted and could be restored. And the red is areas that are already very highly impacted and highly imperiled. The next slide. Okay, so just this month, I don't know if folks you know, read the New York Times, but they, uh, New York Times published a map documenting where biodiversity is most at risk in, in the United States. And you can see here, the highest risk of imperilment or uh, loss of biodiversity is shown in the darkest red. And as, uh, as it gets less and less red and kind of fades down into the yellow or white is the least concentration of imperiled biodiversity. Next slide. The map also showed uh, where areas are permanently protected already for biodiversity. So you can see we do already have in, lot, in, in many parts of, particularly the West, areas that are already protected. Next slide. However, in California, as you can see, we have a lot to lose. The California, California is a, what we call a global biodiversity hotspot because our state is home to more plants and animals than any other state in the United States. We have the highest concentration of what is known as endemic species, which means that we have more, we have endemic species are species that are found nowhere else in the world. So here in California, some examples would be the giant sequoia or coastal redwood or San Joaquin kiff fox or tule elk or California clapper rail. And an interesting fact is that in Sonoma County, 26% of the county's 416 plant species are found nowhere else in the world. Species like the Sonoma sunshine or the Hoffman's jewel flower. So while California has managed in many ways to avoid sizable declines in biodiversity, the threats are taking their toll. And as such, we do have more threatened species than any other state in the United States. Currently, we have 686 species at risk of extinction. So we have a lot to lose here. Next slide. So in 2020, Assemblymember Ash Kalra, who represents the San Jose area, took up the call to protect California's biodiversity and accelerate climate resilience and address inequities in access to nature and introduced a bill called Assembly Bill 3030. And this bill had broad support, but unfortunately it did not survive the legislature because we were in the midst of a COVID crisis. So in the fall of 2020, in October of 2020, Governor Newsom issued an executive order, um, artfully termed N-82-20, we'll just talk about it as an executive order, in which he called for significant progress on biodiversity protection, access to nature, and climate. So here you see a Venn diagram. 
And basically what this is, is it sets forth the three initiatives that the governor wants to achieve. And you can see that these initiatives overlap. 30 by 30 falls within the biodiversity initiative. It is intended to address biodiversity, and, um, but it also can benefit by providing outdoors for all or access to uh, more parks. And it also can benefit by providing climate resilience. So that's how these three components all kind of work together. Um, I'm gonna turn it over now to Ariana to pick up the next part of the story. Thanks, Kim, for laying the groundwork for 30 by 30 and the global and national picture. So like Eamon said, we are excited about this 30 by 30 initiative. It has the potential to transform the county and the state and achieve these three goals. We could see more parks and open space. We can achieve more um, climate resilience by, uh, going, by preserving these areas and also create more access to more people for our natural areas and spaces, which we know were very important to everyone during the pandemic. So we wanted to take the time today to talk to our community, the Sonoma Land Trust community about 30 by 30, get you activated, talk about how our projects and programs overlap on this Venn diagram and help the state achieve the goals. So we're gonna dig deeper into the state's initiative so uh, as uh, Kim mentioned, 30 by 30, what is it again? It is conserving 30% of our land and coastal waters by 2030. We have that executive order issued in October 2020. And then President Biden followed with a national uh, uh, executive order establishing the goal for the whole country. And as Kim mentioned, this is a global to other nations that have also taken this 30 by 30 pledge. And what you see on the screen is this Pathways to 30 by 30 document that was issued in December of last year. And this is laying the groundwork for the state's initiative and how are we actually going to implement this goal in the state. So um, I'm going to talk now about the popularity of 30 by 30. We're going to dig deeper into what is in the Pathways document. So here's a poll from California voters showing strong support for the 30 by 30 initiative. And you can see the Californians understand that it's more than just about biodiversity, that this is about protecting our water resources, our wilderness areas, the parks and open spaces that we enjoy, and also places where wildlife like mountain lions can enjoy, um, can have migration corridors, wildlife corridors to roam over the large spaces they need to have um, genetic diversity and healthy populations. And this is not just supported in California. There was a 2019 poll done by the Center for American Progress that found that 86% of US voters supported this 30 by 30 uh, goal. And then just to back up, um, Kim and I are focusing mostly on the state, but we're also tracking what's happening at the national level. So President Biden created a um, America the Beautiful report, sort of laying the groundwork for the national effort, and then just recently issued this year one report on America the Beautiful and the progress at the national level. Now, the U.S. is a leader in um, preserving intact natural areas. We're one of the top four countries with the most preserved intact areas. And we also have led the way in uh, protecting marine areas. So we've got about a quarter of our marine protected areas in US waters. And we have a strong stewardship ethic working on, uh, on working lands with farmers and ranchers. And other states have similar initiatives. Maine's Climate Council has a goal of conserving 30% of their lands as part of their climate comprehensive plan. Hawaii is focusing on conserving 30% of their near shore waters and watershed areas. And then other states like New York, Nevada, South Carolina, Illinois, New Mexico, and Michigan have proposed similar legislation. But California is leading the way. Um, we have heard that the federal government is seeing how California implements this goal as a model for them. And there's also outside of those states supports from cities. Over 70 mayors wrote in in support of locally led conservation efforts to get to the 30 by 30 goal. Um, so there are some similarities in this America the Beautiful report and the Pathways report from California. Both emphasize equity and um, honoring tribal sovereignty and supporting tribal led conservation and restoration projects. 
Another thing that we'll touch on later is how are we tracking this goal? And so nationally, uh, they are creating what they're calling an American Conservation and Stewardship Atlas. And a beta version of that will be released later this year. Um, and then I think uh, we're gonna talk about the Pathways document, but just to set the stage for the Pathways document, um, we have, and then I'm going to turn it over to Kim, but there was great engagement across California in the conservation community for the Pathways document. There were thousands of participants in over 14 public workshops that were conducted last year in 2021. There were dozens of experts who put together recommendations for the 30 by 30 initiative. And we've seen that there's political will at the capital for 30 by 30 through the funding that's been provided in the historic budget surplus. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Kim to cover more of what's in the Pathways document. Thanks, Ariana. So as noted, following the promulgation of the executive order, the state did embark on a very inclusive public process uh, to seek ideas, hear questions and concerns from the public and develop a framework for implementation. Um, as it was noted, there was actually nine regional workshops that covered the entire state. And there were five topical workshops that provided background information on issues like biodiversity, climate conservation of lands and waters and use of nature-based solutions to advance equity. And also as noted, um, the state did conduct a very extensive outreach and is continuing to with Native American tribes. And in fact has um, held a formal government to government consultations and listening sessions with about 70 tribes. So in December, the California Natural Resources Agency published what it's calling its Pathways to 30 by 30 report. So this is the report that lays out how the state is going to achieve 30% of the protection of lands and waters by 2030. Uh, the publication of the draft Pathways document, as we like, we call it the Pathways document, um, uh, was uh, then preceded by a public comment period and the public comment period closed in February uh, 15th. Um, and le like was already noted, thousands of comments were submitted, including the Sonoma Land Trust submitting comments, along with many, many other organizations and entities and individuals. So I think the state has done a really great job of listening to all the various interest uh, parties on you know, how do we achieve um, this goal, which is not a, an insignificant goal. Um, now the key objectives for the pathways report are not surprisingly to protect biodiversity, expand equitable access to nature and build climate resilience. And the report provides a call to action and a framework that many different partners can understand and participate in depending on their roles and their capacities. Uh, the report focuses on voluntary action and partnerships it recognizes the full spectrum of conservation approaches to achieve the 30 by 30 goal. Uh, and I would note it is not a regulatory document and it certainly is not providing a one size fits all solution. The other thing it's not doing is it's not identifying exactly where in the state the areas that need to be conserved. The state is very much open and wanting to hear from the regions, from the communities about where they think are important. They are still though using science to guide their decisions. So they are trying to identify areas that have important biodiversity value, but they want to make this a bottom up rather than a top down kind of approach to conservation. And so the document is organized around guiding objectives, principles and commitments and a set of nine strategic actions areas that people can support. So the nine strategies to achieve the goal include supporting private conservation led by partners like the Sonoma Land Trust, creating more parks in park poor communities, strengthening coordination and aligning conservation actions and investments across all scales of government. So local, regional, county, state and federal. Um, and the role of federal lands, so the role of public lands currently, are there things that we can be doing to strengthen conservation on public lands already? And then also accelerating restoration of degraded ecosystems. So with this is another very important thing. It's something that the Sonoma Land Trust does quite a bit. 
Next slide. So the Pathways Report also answers the critical question of what do we mean when we talk about conservation? Or in other words, what counts towards the 30% goal? So the definition essentially comes down to sort of really two key things. One is, is the area that we're counting durably protected? Meaning, is it protected over the long term? So it can't be overturned easily or someone changes their mind. It has to be as permanent as you can get. And secondly, is the area being managed over the long term to promote biodiversity? So biodiversity value is critical. Those two key components are important to the definition of conservation. And so if you apply those two components to California, the state estimates that we have currently conserved approximately 24 million acres or 24% of our state. And that we'll need to conserve another 6 million acres of land. Now, I would note that I think the number is going to change. I actually think the number of what we'll need to conserve will probably get smaller because the state has um, not, doesn't have complete information in its database. So for example, we know that they are not counting a number of conservation easements. These are easements that are put over uh, land that in which the landowners are committing permanently to manage their lands for conservation. So I'm assuming the number is gonna go change a little bit, but we still have a pretty significant goal in the land in terms to get to 30 million acres. And on coastal waters, it's even trickier because the state estimates we've conserved about 16% of coastal waters. It is essentially deferring the answer to what do we do need to do next to when they finish with something, it's something called the decadal review of the marine protected areas, which will get wrapped up in another year. And once that uh, 10 year review is done, then the state's gonna turn to how do we tackle get, achieving the goal of coastal water protection. So I'm gonna turn it back to Ariana. Thanks, Kim. And I would just yeah. note that my children have come home. So apologies in advance of a five-year-old and a seven-year-old uh, show up. I might <laughs> just, anyway. Um, so yeah, so like Kim mentioned, I just wanted to say um, we have, uh, we are working on trying to get those numbers accurate for California. And I think our own staff member, GIS wizard, Joseph Kenyon is in the audience. And so he is working with the state to get that, uh, the county for the conservation easements and the, and the county correct. So thanks, Joe, Joseph, for doing that. Um, so moving on to the equity aspect of this. And so, um, so we know that uh, disadvantaged communities have bared the brunt of, um, of uh, environmental harms and that they haven't always had access to all the benefits like having a park nearby. And it's not just air and water pollution, but lack of access, places to enjoy biodiversity. And one way that 30 by 30 can help remedy this inequity is um, protecting, managing, restoring nature and biodiversity that's near what is called climate vulnerable communities. So um, we can direct the investments that we're seeing from 30 by 30 at the state and federal level um, by focusing on these climate vulnerable or marginalized and underinvested communities. And one of the core commitments for the 30 by 30 initiative is centering what they're calling justice, equity, diversity, um, and inclusion in planning, decision making, and implementation. And in terms of showing support and um, also prioritizing working with Indigenous communities, Governor Newsom recently announced a budget proposal to establish $100 million in a funding opportunity to support tribal-led initiatives that advance shared climate and conservation goals. So what I want to talk specifically about today is how Sonoma Land Trust projects and programs are hitting that Venn diagram that Kim mentioned. So the three main objectives of 30 by 30, increasing public access, climate resilience, protecting biodiversity through this conservation of 30% uh, of our lands. So um, we have projects and programs that are focused on these threatened species and habitat areas. It's one thing to just like get to that goal of 30 by 30, but we also wanna think about what can we do strategically to achieve these goals? What do we need to do? Where do we need to do it? So we are focused on the most threatened species and habitat areas in Sonoma County. 
and we're achieving the goals through our 17 nature preserves um, and also through conservation easements, which Kim just mentioned. Uh, we have 47 conservation easements covering 70,000 acres of land. And again, a conservation easement is a voluntary legal agreement between a landowner and the land trust uh, that keeps the land in private ownership while protecting key resources. And much of our conservation easements were identified for their unique biological values. So we've got programs that are going to help get us to 30 by 30. So set it, the framing for the Bay Area and, and the accounting that we've seen. So the Bay Area Green Print, I recommend checking it out, perusing this website when you get a chance, breaks down the protected lands by the nine different counties. And you can see Sonoma County where we're at there. And according to their accounting, we are at 21%. And I should note that the Bay Area does have a goal of 20, 50% conservation by 2050, but we need to get to the 30% goal here in Sonoma County. And then, as I mentioned, we've got Joseph Kenyon on staff GIS um, expert here at Sonoma Land Trust created this awesome map that's breaking down the specifics here in Sonoma County um, and working with other agencies here to do this accounting. And you can see where our um, anchor and ecological preserves are on this map where our conservation easements are. And with this calculation, it came out to that about 22.3% of Sonoma County is protected. Now there's a little bit of a discrepancy um, between the green print and this one, but that's probably just based on different accounting and when the accounting was made. So now I wanna talk specifically about the three projects here at Sonoma Land Trust that are helping the state and the nation reach these 30 by 30 goals by hitting all three points on that Venn diagram. And the projects that we are so grateful for the support of the Sonoma Land Trust community and we'll ask you to um, uh, take some action at the end of the webinar to show further support for these particular projects. So first I'll start with the Baylands. This is a current map, but prior to 1850s, the Bayland was this vast mosaic of tidal and seasonal wetlands. You had nutrients and sediment and water from the upper watershed mixing with tidal waters. And it was this rich eco-diverse area that was teeming with life. But then in um, the late 19th and early 20th century, the Sonoma Creek Baylands were developed and about 80% of the wetlands around San Francisco Bay were diked and drained for agriculture and other purposes. And so we have this fragmented habitat that you see here on this map of the San Pablo Bay Baylands. And you can see our plans for um, restoration here. So we've got the green is the restoration in progress or complete and the uh, orange is the restoration planning with hopes of you know reaching most of this boundary that we have for the historic um, Baylands. But right now, since we have so much of this um, area disturbed, we're seeing consequences like flooding um, and at the areas at risk of sea level rise. And if there's a severe storm, you know, Highway 37 is closed for weeks at a time. And then we've dealing with loss of habitat with the conversion to um, the diked uh, baylands used for agriculture. So our goal here is to conserve and then connect all these different acres. So we'd have a total um, area of 20,000 acres. And our goal is to restore up to 10,000 acres of wetlands by that uh, point of 2030. And that's gonna produce a lot of benefits. Some of those same three that we talked about before, sequester carbon. So we're increasing the carbon resilience of the area, provide habitat. So that's gonna protect biodiversity, reduce flooding on Highway 37, and create opportunities for public access in these wetlands. And so we are um, under contract on one parcel, working on another parcel, and we will let you know as those projects um, go public where we are in progress. So another exciting project I wanted to share with you all is the Sonoma Mountain Vernal Pools. So there's a picture of one of the vernal pools, which is great habitat for rare species. So we're working on acquisition of this property, 174 acres, and lots of really diverse, cool habitat there. The vernal pools, oak woodlands, which we know support a high diversity of species, uh, chaparral, meadows and grasslands, and the Ulupa Creek, which is supporting steelhead. Another benefit of 
acquiring this property is that it's uh, creating a wildlife corridor. So what I mentioned before, the value of these wildlife corridors, allowing these species to um, go to different areas, mix and, and protect their genetic diversity. Um, and then, like I mentioned, the vernal pools in oak woodland support rare and threatened plant species. And I think, oh, and the other thing that's really cool about this uh, Sonoma Mountain vernal pools is that it is gonna connect the parts. So it's gonna help connect Jack London State Park with Annandale State Park through a new segment of the Bay Area Ridge Trail. And then in terms of the steelhead, this is going to help with the federally threatened Northern California steelhead by reducing threats of water quality, quantity, and temperature. So we're currently under contract with landowners to purchase this property. And so the third project that Sonoma Land Trust is working on now that supports 30 by 30 that I wanted to mention is the McCormick Ranch. So this is a 654 acre ranch. It's along the, it's between Napa and Sonoma counties. It's adjacent to Sugarloaf Ridge State Park and Hood Mountain Regional Park and Open Space Preserve. And it's got stunning views, steep canyons, riparian forests, excellent habitat and wildlife support. Um, so we've got black, we've got uh, black bear mountain lions that have been spotted on the property and um, another habitat stronghold. So again, helping protect biodiversity by conserving and acquiring this property. And then also some freshwater resources and these tributaries um, are gonna help with coho salmon and steelhead trout as because it's a source, this property is a source of clean water for three different watersheds. And again, it's gonna help with that um, public access, it's going to help connecting different types of protected areas and parklands, and again, another part of the Bay Area Ridge Trail. Um, and really important for that habitat stronghold and connectivity, uh, the species that we've seen use this wildlife corridor include the in addition to the black bear mountain lion, bobcat, ringtail, American badger, and black-tailed deer. So this is going to help with connectivity and prevent fragmentation and also enhance resiliency to climate change. And then I'm going to turn it back over to Kim to talk about the funding needs to implement 30 by 30. Thank you. So it's exciting that the state is undergoing this 30 by 30 initiative. The fact that California stepped up even before the federal government and embraced the concept of protecting 30% of our lands and waters as part of an international effort is wonderful. And the fact that they are putting a plan together is fabulous and a database. However, none of this is gonna happen unless we, don't unless we have funding. So funding is absolutely critical uh, for many reasons. Um, and we need dedicated and significant funding because if we are to protect and conserve and manage and restore the acres that we need to meet this goal, we're going to need substantial investment. Currently, the state in its budget proposal has around $768 million that is, it says will be available for in part for 30 by 30 or nature-based solutions as they call it uh, over the next two years uh, with another $222 million that are earmarked for the Wildlife Conservation Board. But this is um, money that is being, I think looked upon by many different people and we need significantly more. So we're Sonoma Land Trust and is working in collaboration with many other organizations and entities to advocate for greater investment in the Wildlife Conservation Board, in the State Coastal Conservancy, um, in the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and in those programs and uh, entities that we have historically gone to and received funding from, and who have a history of providing money for acquisition, restoration, and ongoing management. And currently the specific ask that we're directing to the legislature and the administration is that we believe that to really be sincere about achieving this goal, the state needs to invest at least $1 billion annually for 30 by 30 with an additional billion dollars for coastal resilience and protection. Now this funding would go, like I said, to acquisition, to management of lands and to restoration. 
But we also need funding for science and monitoring to provide good data so that we're making these decisions about what, what to do and where to do it based on, on good information and to fund capacity building because this is not going to be done by the state alone or by the federal government alone. This is going to require a massive undertaking by all kinds of partners, including the Sonoma Land Trust. So we're seeking funding for capacity building to support tribes, land trusts, resource conservation districts, community-based organizations, and other nonprofits that do critical on the ground work um, to acquire land, to identify where land should be protected, to do outreach, to envision um, what can be done to enhance lands um, and to, to do more management of lands and waters. Um, I would just note that the state did um, just recently uh, announce a hundred million dollar investment that they're proposing into the budget for next year to support tribes uh, in capacity in order to fulfill 30 by 30. So that's a fantastic down payment for tribes and we're hoping to secure additional capacity building for non-tribal interests as well in, and as well as money for um, securing uh, easements, acquisitions, restorations, like I noted. So funding is absolutely necessary and unless we get a significant down payment, it's gonna be very hard and an ongoing source of funding, it's going to be very hard for us to be able to achieve these goals. I will note that the state funding is also critical because we can use it to leverage federal money that's available. So the Federal Land and Water Conservation Fund was recently reauthorized in, um, in the something called the Great American Outdoors Act. And so now we have a really important funding stream for federal money that we can use to match with state money. And of course, there's always private investments that could be made through foundations or other gifts by, by uh, donors. So there's a way of leveraging the state money. So the state isn't doing this alone, but we need them in, they, we need them to be putting skin in the game in order for this thing to work. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Ariana. Thanks, Kim outlining those funding needs and we'll get to that because that's our call to action here is to ask you all to um, uh, advocate for this funding that we need from the state legislature and, and let them know that the public cares about this. But before we get to that, I just want to mention the California Nature website to do this tracking. So on the website, you've got different maps you can explore outlining again those three goals of protecting biodiversity, increasing climate change resilience, and um, increasing access to natural spaces. And then you can see where we are. And as Kim mentioned, that number is probably going to change because they don't have quite the most accurate accounting yet. And we are helping them figure that out. So again, currently, according to their accounting, 24% of land and 16% are already conserved in the state. And then the California Nature website is going to track progress towards the goal. And right now they're saying it's 6 million acres of land and half a million acres of coastal waters to reach 30%. And so there's the link there to the California Nature website if you want to do some exploring on your own. And now uh, the action alert. So as Kim mentioned, the need is $1 billion that we're asking from the California State Legislature. So we're asking you to contact your state rep um, and request funding for 30 by 30 to implement this. This is not something that the California Natural Resources Agency can do on their own and the different um, non-governmental organizations and agencies can do on their own. It's gonna take a collective effort of all of us working together and having the funding we need to implement this goal. And then also we're asking you to um, let them know you support the Sonoma Land Trust projects, the ones I mentioned and some others that are gonna help the state achieve the goal of 30 by 30. So we have a 30 by 30 page on um, the Sonoma Land Trust website where you'll see how to find your rep if you're not sure who your rep is, sample messages, talking points, and then um, contact links to send your email or call your state legislature. So in closing, I'll just say that it's we're now at March 2022. We have about eight or nine years to achieve this goal, we've got one year down, but the clock is ticking. And as Eamon has, has said in the past, we have to get these goals done by 2030. We need to conserve these areas if we wanna 
protect the area, be climate resilient, not have these catastrophic climate change impacts like sea level rise, flooding, extreme heat, droughts, and severe uh, wildfire. So we thank you for your support. And I think I'll turn it over to Eamon for questions. Wonderful. Um, first of all, thank you both. Thank you, Kim. And thank you, Ariana, for what is what I think was one of the most concise uh, 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 descriptions of what's a huge, pro sprawling subject, which is still a work in progress. So um, thank you both for that clarity around what the, the big issues are. Uh, thank you all for, uh, to the folks who've joined us here, uh, listening and uh, learning more about the importance of this uh, initiative. Uh, we're just giving a moment or two for folks who want to drop off to, to, to do that before we begin uh, the Q&A. Um, to follow up on uh, Ariana's uh, uh, call to action, um, what we would do is also suggest that you keep engaged with us, the Land Trust, by following our various social media accounts where we do share a lot of this information in bite-sized chunks uh, and or, uh, and you can do it on social media or, or just check out our website. Um, on the website, you can uh, check out past presentations that we've done. Um, and our website is sonomalandtrust.org. And the particular page you might want to check out is Nature at Home. Um, keep an eye out. Uh, for our month, other monthly language of the land webinars, we uh, post pretty regularly what the new sub, what the next subject is, and who the presenters are. So do stay in touch and learn more about what we're doing. Um, as Kim and Ariana have said, uh, we're out there beating the bushes and making the case for Sonoma to our elected representatives, to our agency heads, and. We're also, uh, you're a land trust, we're managing um, thousands of acres of protected land across the county. The folks uh, who make that possible are you. You, our donors, make that work possible. None of, or almost none of that billion dollars pays for uh, the work that we do in preparing and making the case uh, to the, the, the state for the work that needs to be done, the preparation of the scientific information, the maps, the advocacy, and the day-to-day -day stewardship of these protected areas. That money comes from you, our donors. And uh, we rely on that from those donations from individuals, businesses, and foundations to make that work possible. Um, if you, if you like what you have heard today, please consider donating. Your gift helps support the Land uh, Trust in its protection and preservation work. To make a donation uh, to the Sonoma Land Trust, just go online. Uh, visit sonomalandtrust.org and click the donate button. And if, you are, if you've already done that, thank you so much. And if you're going to do that, thank you so much again. In these very uncertain times, we appreciate everyone who is supporting our work. So on to the question and answer session. And we've got lots of questions teed up from all of you. This is a very engaged audience and frankly, a very knowledgeable one. So, and they've thrown some, uh, I, I'll start off with an easy question, but I, uh, they definitely get more complex as I've been reviewing them. Um, so, um, Questions again can be submitted via the Q and A button at the bottom, and um, let's get let's get to the first one. So, um, how much of Sonoma County uh, is already protected? I think we saw a number of uh, like twenty one percent. Do we know what that is in acres? And if not, uh, do we know how much of our coastline and uh, is protected? And you've shown us how much we compare to neighboring counties. It, it seems like I think 20% of a 21% of a 100,000 acre county is what 90 that is is 110,000 acres and to get to 30% we'd need another 90,000 30% we need another 90,000 acres maybe I'm wrong in the math there. Uh, but but guys, can you help me out and figure out what that number might look like just in terms of acres. 
Yeah, let's see. Here's the um, here is the map that Joseph Kenyon made for Sonoma County. So it's like a million acres. I know it's kind of small <laughs> to see. Um, and that's breaking down. I mean, it does include the marine protected areas um, that he's got here on the map. So it looks like it's a tall order to get to that 30% by the end of 2030. Um, and we'll do a little math in the background to, to, to get that to you. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty significant number just in terms of acres. But um, one of the questions that kind of came from that, and this was sort of the lead into what I thought was a very important question, how do we encourage those efforts? How do we encourage 30 by 30, not just to be about acres or numbers of acres, that making that the driving factor? Um, you know, there's, a, there's some worry out there that 30 by 30, you know, might encourage the largest number of acres with less nuance on ecological factors. And I'll turn it over to both of you, maybe, maybe Kim, if you want to start off and then um, uh, Ariana can chime in. So that definitely has been a concern that folks have raised. Um, you know, it's been raised by um, people in the Los Angeles area who have said like, hey, we've got really, you know, fragmented landscape and it's important to protect even small areas and you're not gonna wanna do that. Um, it's, been, it's been expressed by many folks. I would say there's a couple things. One is for Sonoma in particular, you guys are very lucky to have Sonoma Land Trust who has done an amazing amount of work to identify areas that are of high conserva conservation value. So there's a lot of information that the, that the Sonoma you know, has and, and because of the work done by the land trust to identify where those most important places are. And so you sort of have a leg up in that, in that sense. Um, but I would also say that the state is committed to the fact that 30 by 30 is a biodiversity conservation uh, effort, and they are very committed to the equitable access to nat nature component. And I think because of those two in particular, that they are going to be looking at smaller, high biodiversity areas and are not going to be simply kind of trying to just run up big chunks of area. Because quite honestly, if we were going to do that, we would try to turn to federal lands and maybe change designations on federal lands and do that and then call it a day but that will not get us to what we need to achieve in terms of biodiversity conservation. So I think that with that being the driver, it, um, you know, it, it, uh, it, I think it will push the fact that we won't be just doing big chunks of land. Thanks, Kim and Ariana, anything to add to that? Yeah, I think it also is uh, making the case for why to conserve more land if you say, look, it's got, it's achieving all three of these objectives, the increasing public access, providing, you know, uh, to park poor communities. It's also helping with climate resilience. It's helping protect biodiversity. Look at how much value you're getting for this investment on conserving this land. So I think you can make that argument. And I would also say that the state is you know, figuring this out and um, relying on public input. So we are, you know, seeing is there going to be some sort of like, how are they going to prioritize the land and, and providing comments for how we think that those decisions should be made and what, how they're weighing different factors. Um, well, you know, I, I would just one, just add one quick thing. Um, something that the Sonoma Land Trust really does a, a lot of work on, which is really important um, and is wildlife connectivity. And that is that that actually begs name a lot of times two smaller pieces, but these are the critical linkage that link other pieces together. So I, I know the state is very much looking at that. There's a program at the Wildlife Conservation Board specific to that. And in fact, the resources agency just had a big webinar um, on Monday talking about how California really wants to double down on wildlife connectivity. So that that then talks about little pieces that are biologically critical. And that's very good news for our um, very civil discussion around the uh, Sonoma Developmental Center Wildlife Corridor. So we're hoping that the state will see sense on, on that sooner rather than later. 
Um, another question that came up um, was, you know, the quality of protection. Um, you know, it, 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 it suggested, I mean, the question was specifically about federal lands, but I think it could also include state lands. In are all sort of public lands considered protected? Um, and what about agencies that have a mandate for, you know, essentially extraction like BLM and, and to some extent forests? So that's a really, that's an excellent question. Um, and it's not, it's, it's tough. Uh, so when I outlined the definition of conservation, I talked about durability of protection, meaning how long is that commitment for, and how um, solid is that commitment for protection? And then is the area being primarily managed for biodiversity? So for lands that are under a multiple use mandate, uh, like lands administered by the Bureau of Land Management or the US Forest Service, a lot of those lands won't count. However, if lands are identified or secured as wilderness areas or national parks, or on the BLM, there's something called national conservation lands. These are permanently, or as close to anything's permanent, protected areas that are being primarily managed for conservation and biodiversity. Those lands will count. But I suspect there will be some uh, debating back and forth uh, over this particular issue. One area is roadless areas. Are they sufficiently protected through rulemaking or are they not? Some people would argue yes, some people would argue no. President Trump overturned the Tongass protections in Alaska for roadless areas. So some would say maybe it's not protected. But for private lands, those would be lands that would be acquired for conservation purposes or lands under con a permanent conservation easement. Those would be lands that are counted towards the 30% goal. Yes, and I think it also, um, you know, speaks to, I think, um, you know, the, the, the question and just to, you know, to, to, to get to the idea that, you know, these lands just because they're protected, meaning they're not subject to development or extraction, perhaps some of these lands, others are, it doesn't mean to say by any stretch of the imagination that they are somehow nothing that we need worry about. They are at much of risk from climate change as uh, even as developed areas are. And, and that kind of leads into, I, I think, another fascinating and really important question, which is, does 30 by 30 really put enough emphasis on climate adaptation? you know, the resilience aspect of, of climate change, because, um, you know, I think, you know, for a lot of, you know, the folks, certainly not the folks in this audience, because I think this is a, an audience that get, this is an audience that definitely gets it. The conversation tends to be around climate sequestration and climate, you know, carbon sinks, you know, which pro protected land can do. But, but what, is, what, what is the role of 30 by 30 in creating more resilience and being able to weather some of the stresses of climate change? I feel like the Baylands is a great example of how you're gonna achieve those objectives. And if we do reach our goal of restoring 10,000 acres in the Baylands, that is gonna help with that resilience and protect the nearby communities from flooding and sea level rise and also help with carbon sequestration because no, according to NOAA, the wetlands sequester carbon at rates even higher, 10 times higher than most forested, forested systems. So those tidal wetlands are really important for carbon sequestration and climate resilience. So as long as we're emphasizing those areas and the climate benefits and why they should be conserved as 30 by 30, then I think we're gonna advance that part of the objectives for 30 by 30. Yeah, we showed that Venn diagram, you know, that showed biodiversity, climate resilience, and uh, outdoors for all. The more you can fit within the overlap, the higher priority I think the area will be for protection uh, from the state's perspective because they want to get a bigger bang for the buck. So if you can have biodiversity and climate resilience in one particular area and also, you know, provide uh, outdoor opportunities, 
that's like the, the gold standard. And I do know the state is very much looking at that. Um, and, you know, again, Sonoma Land Trust has done the work in, in the Sonoma Bay lands to identify the areas. There's other areas that they're gonna need to do some more science and the state's committed to, to doing the work there to try to find that information. But yeah, I mean, with climate change happening, vegetation is moving, species are shifting. This is the important of co importance of connectivity. So I do think that resilience is very much top of mind uh, to the state and to the, to the, to the natural resource managers um, that are working on this. Well, a question that's sort of somewhat related to that is, um, you know, the, the issue that those of us who've been in conservation a long time struggle with on a daily basis is that very often the emphasis under the old mindset was just get it under protection. And we've talked a little bit about, you know, how climate change is changing things. So we're going to have to change that approach. Um, but there still is some resistance to the idea that ongoing uh, care for and protection for these already, these landscapes that are already in everything from major national parks to local regional parks. Is there anything in 30 by 30 that you think could change the equation for uh, and include local regional parks in that 30 by 30 equation uh, and thinking about different ways to manage and protect and steward these properties for the long term? So yeah, I, I think regional parks um, and, and, and other parks have, it, have, the option, have the opportunity, I think, to qualify for 30 by 30. It'll come down to how they're being managed over the long term. Are they being managed primarily for biodiversity conservation and what are the commitments for management? One of the things I really hope for is that, you know, like as you noted, We've been going out and acquiring, but managing lands, like the state owns a lot of land. The Department of Fish and Wildlife owns more than a million acres of land, but they have very little money to actually manage that land. And I'm hoping that this ups the ante in terms of um, commitments to do more management. And as climate change happens, we are seeing that we have to do more work on lands to manage them with fire risk, with invasive plants, um, so, you know, I'm, I think one, there is a great opportunity for regional parks and for regional parks to secure additional funding for management and for trying to get more emphasis on management and, and not just like, let's buy the land and count it, but like, we're going to have to steward it over the long term. And I think that also, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I think it just also goes back to that funding need and emphasizing that we need funding for stewardship and management that how you're managing the land might be even more important than who's owning the land and that that stewardship and management matters for public access. Um, so you need the funds for that if we're going to make a difference there. And I think, you know, again, the Baylands is another great example that it's not just about coming to the federal, the state government with our handout saying we need more money. It's about investments in what we call natural infrastructure like wetlands that are vastly cheaper to build than seawalls actually solve the problem, at least locally, whereas seawalls transfer the problem to elsewhere and get stronger over time instead of having to be, you know, periodically refurbished and maintained in the way that, um, you know, hard gray infrastructure would have to be. Um, so I think I think that, that those are ways in which we will we'll be thinking about our regional parks. I think in a, in different ways, we won't just be seeing them as places to recreate or places to you know have a picnic or ride a bike. There'll be places that will be key um, heat island re uh, reducers or flood attenuators or. Uh, fuel and wildfire calming areas. There would be more than just simply parks in the way that we've traditionally understood them. I'd like to stop for a minute, you know, talking about policy for a second and just like have a conversation because I thought this was a very interesting question. Um, 
and I, this is all speculation. If a gray wolf visited the county, would it be able to access all of the 30 by 30 areas, just hypothetically speaking? Are the lands connected in some way for a large mammal? Well, the first part of that answer, I can say yes, because we have mountain lions. Um, but, but, you know, Ariana, do you have any thoughts about that? Or, you know, if, if, and I think it goes actually beyond if we've got enough property. I think it's, there's some cultural and other issues that we'd have to, we'd have to deal with. I'm not sure, but I recently heard about a wolverine being spotted <laughs> near the Baylands, which I thought was so exciting. I didn't even know that their range was here. But I think it also gets back to like the wildlife corridor and the support we're seeing, even from the federal government, that there is new funding through the bipart. I know I went back to policy, but it's exciting to me that there is like federal funding. And You're a policy wonk. I, I know for the wildlife corridors, and that we can access that funding and have that be matching funding to help with building these culverts or whatever we knew to we need to make it safer for wildlife to pass under uh, roads or, or whatever else we need. And I think, you know, the, go ahead, Tim, you were going to say, Kim. Oh, I, I was just going to say, I mean, you know, so first of all, we've have, we have come to see that wolves can get pretty far, considering there was the one who made it all the way down to Bakersfield um, and into Ventura, believe it or not, um, was like literally on the edge almost to, the, to Los Angeles, and unfortunately um, passed away, but they're wide ranging species. The question is, is once they show up, are they going to have a hospitable uh, environment. And um, I think Ariana's point about connectivity is really critical because, um, you know, they do get run over. Um, the other thing is, is, you know, the other opportunity here, and this is beyond 30 by 30, but 30 by 30 is a strategy for protecting biodiversity, but it is not the way we stop impairment and endangered species altogether. We're going to need lots of other types of efforts of you know, coexistence um, opportunities among landowners who are willing to do things like that. You know, there, there's a lot of work being done um, to, to not just protect land, but also for lands that are being actively used to make them more permeable and amenable to wildlife. So there's, there's a whole matrix of things that can be, can be done. And 30 by 30 is a piece of it, but it's a piece of a bigger, bigger puzzle. But yeah, wolves are, Wolves are very hardy. <laughs> yes. Well, and interestingly, you know, we talk about a concept in um, conservation, you know, a keystone species, or, or another way that we talk about them are ecosystem engineers. And they're not always the very charismatic wild animals like mountain lions and gray wolves. Um, you know, in one, in one case, one of the most important ecosystem engineers I've ever worked with is a California scrub jay, um, a species that's found only, uh, this particular species, the island scrub jay, is only found on Santa Cruz Island. Uh, in other cases, um, various organizations are studying uh, how beavers, the reintroduction of beavers, might be a way to solve some of our water storage problems for the future, given that with a, uh, an atmospheric temperature increase of even just one or two degrees, we may not see the Sierra, the Sierra snowpack may go away in our lifetimes. I mean, it's not that the precipitation won't fall, it just won't fall as snowpack. So we've got to figure out ways to store a lot of that, that water. And it's, it's not a problem we're going to engineer our way out of. And it may be a way that, uh, for example, beavers may be one of the ways that uh, we, we sequester and capture that groundwater. Have you, uh, Eamon, have you seen the video of the project in Idaho where they were parachuting beavers into different locations? No, please oh. put the link to that in the chat because yeah. I need to know. <laughs> I'll look for it. And so I was volunteering and my son, he's in second grade in the library and the librarian showed this video. And then this kid raised his hand. This is a wonderful description of beavers as a keystone species. And the librarian was like, did you hear that? And I was like, yes, and it wasn't my son, but I'm going to educate him. I'm going to show him that video and I'll, I'll find it and put it in the chat. Excellent. Um, so um, 
another question, and I think you've alluded to it, uh, Kim, um, is um, this issue of uh, working lands and the role that they will play in perhaps 30 by 30, but overall, can you speak a little bit to how working lands, how the state's thinking about working lands and the overall picture of climate adaptation, since it's not just about, it's both things like how are we gonna grow the food we're gonna eat and how can agriculture support uh, biodiversity because it doesn't always do a good job of, job of that. Right, yeah, so the executive order talked about biodiversity and climate resilience. And um, they, the other, we didn't talk about this, but in addition to the 30 by 30 effort, the state is putting together a climate smart land strategy. So uh, working lands has a role to play in either uh, and both. Um, because you have, um, like I've done, a, I, I, in my work with defenders had been doing work with the, with, and you guys, I, I know do this as well, is um, working with, with uh, cattle ranchers. So there's a lot of, there is science out there for some ecosystems where managed grazing can have uh, uh, environmental benefits, particularly in vernal pool landscapes. And, um, and so there are ranchers that put conservation easements over their rangelands and continue to do managed grazing, uh, you know, stay out of riparian areas and other sensitive areas. And those areas, could be a part of the 30 by 30 matrix. For other areas, um, like maybe row crops that might not be managed primarily for biodiversity, but have hedgerows or do other types of efforts to promote biodiversity or carbon sequestration or climate resiliency, they could uh, perhaps, uh, you know, there's, there are programs that the state is putting forward to try to encourage those types of beneficial practices. So it's not, it's not like there's one solution for everything. It's going to take lots of different things and partnerships in managing um, uh, regenerative agriculture, I think is something that has great, great value. Um, and again, it may not always tick every box for 30 by 30, but it'll, it'll tick boxes uh, for, for climate resiliency. And so I think, again, there's a huge opportunity to partner with on the working landscape and um, have it be more, even more uh, beneficial uh, for what we need. Yeah, I mean, I think it, this is a huge topic and we could spend a webinar or webinars alone talking about solving um, so many of the challenges that uh, working lands, landowners are facing and how they can be um, a part of the solution. And the will is definitely there. I mean, they all see perhaps even better than most of us who don't spend a lot of time on the land. They are seeing the direct effects of climate change. And yet, I mean, and we talk about this with equity and fairness, the burden for um, solving climate change needs, we all need to share in that. And you know, working landowners need to be part of the solution in ways that you know they're not unfairly expected to, 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 to shoulder that burden. And some of the ways that that burden shows up is there are lots of incentives, such as entering, for example, the cap and trade program, but it has to be for very, very large blocks of land, you know, thousands and thousands of acres. And if you look at the land ownership mix in uh, uh, Sonoma County, 40 acres is the average. So some of the work that organizations like ours are doing is thinking about how do you aggregate landowners so that they can avail of some of these incentives, some of this funding, some of this investment in climate and uh, biodiversity friendly uh, uh, food production. Um, the other uh, I think uh, overlooked uh, aspect to this is that um, there are uh, uh, programs currently underway that are showing not only, you know, is it possible to, you know, make a living as a working landowner and be biologically friendly, 
but that it's often a mutually reinforcing relationship. Uh, I think about the pop-up wetlands that we're seeing that, you know, uh, in, the, in the northern part of the state where in, an, in exchange for flooding landscapes uh, or keeping landscapes flooded during migratory bird seasons, um, farmers are starting to see their rice yields uh, increase. And this is uh, exactly the kind of reciprocity that we're, we're hoping to see in, in working uh, lands management. Just also um, emphasize the voluntary aspect of this. And like Kim said, the pathways document is not regulatory. And the same thing with the national initiative, America the Beautiful, it's, it's encouraging voluntary partnerships. So we need private landowners, we need working lands people, we need all of to be together on this if we wanna achieve 30 by 30. Um, a question has come up is uh, how are rivers and waterways being specifically looked at, do we know, in, in the 30 by 30 pathways document? So they, there, <clears throat> interestingly, there wasn't a specific water strategy, which many people pointed out. However, I do know that the state is going to make sure that they cover that more uh, carefully and specifically um, in their in their document. So um, they're looking at it in, in a number of different ways. They're looking at it in terms of um, the, how the waterway fits within the larger landscape. So that um, you know, if you're counting a particular area, you're going to want to make sure that the water features that are part of that area are also uh, you know in good condition and healthy. So wetlands. I mean, some of the most biodiverse areas are water associated, uh, riparian areas, wetlands. Um, these are areas that have high value. Uh, and so those will be areas I think are gonna be very much focused on. The other thing is um, many people had recommended that the state look more at designating what they call outstanding natural waters designations, um, looking at, uh, in encouraging greater in-stream flow uh, acquisitions so that we know that water will be flowing through areas at the appropriate times when species need them. Um, designation of wild and scenic rivers, both at the state level and the national level is another option. And in the coastal area, um, you know, doing, and, and restoration. So this is another opportunity where we could be looking at culverts, uh, remove, you know, removal of um, barriers in streams, dam removal, culvert uh, replacements and restoration. So water has a significant role to play when you're thinking about it, particularly in terms of like the bang for the buck for biodiversity. And that's something that in particular we're working on very specifically. It's a new body of work for us here uh, at the Land Trust where we have um, just finished an extensive scientific analysis of the, of the five most important sub-watersheds of the Russian River and looked at right down to the parcel level what strategies we would use with uh, different land types that abut the river to increase water flow in, in the Russian River. Um, and they range from outright uh, uh, protection and uh, 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 making part of a park to restoration, uh, uh, particular kinds of restoration to increase and improve the flow of water. And then really innovative new tools that um, uh, uh, the state has introduced such as uh, water forbearances whereby there is a deal struck between landowners and the state to incentivize landowners to release water that they know they won't need at times when uh, the river needs it most. And uh, those deals include tax incentives and, and other sorts of uh, funding investments. So there's depth, that is a new territory for conservation in, in California. And we're pioneering some of that uh, with some of the early work that we've done on, on the Russian River. Um, a question's come up and, you know, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of the state, uh, excuse me, the county's agencies, but um, a question's come up about 
has 30 by 30 being considered and included in the county's general plan update? And what about ag and open spaces strategic plan? Um, you know, Ariana, I don't know if there's anything you'd want to say to that, but um, uh, from, from our perspective, one of the things to remember about organizations like the Land Trust and like agencies like Ag and Open Space, particularly here in Sonoma County, is that 30 by 30 is in some ways the result of the work we've done on the ground to identify the problems, the challenges and the solutions and how that's created a groundswell of movement for the state to take action. And by that, I mean that um, you might not find the words in earlier versions of uh, 30, the words 30 by 30 in earlier versions of the Ag and Open Space Plan, but the spirit of it is very much there because it's the same idea, the same sets of ideas. And I know that the county staff, we've been talking with them uh, as close partners, thinking about how we will coordinate some of this work so that we're obviously not duplicating the effort, how we're coordinating that effort uh, and, uh, and ensuring that it's aligned with the funding sources that will be available through 30 by 30. Uh, Ariana, anything that you'd add to that or Kim, anything that you would throw in in terms of how the state's thinking about pushing down to, you know, um, uh, maybe not even so much our county, but counties that don't have an organ something like Ag and Open Space and creating the planning to coordinate that. I guess I'll just say that Ag and Open Space is engaged on 30 by 30 and so many comment letters and we were working with them to make sure that the data that the state has is accurate for the county. Yeah, I, um, the state's emphasis on voluntariness, I think that they don't want to make any kinds of mandates to counties on terms of their general plans. I mean, it has been suggested in some of the comments that the People should be working at their local level to encourage their, uh, if their general plan updates are occurring and if they're updating their open space element that they take into consideration some of this information, um, then that's an opportunity. But I don't think we'll see the state doing this top down, you shall update your element to reflect 30 by 30. Well, we're getting close to the end of our time. Um, uh, one last question, I think it's a pretty straightforward one, is uh, what state agency will be funding projects for 30 by 30? And I think just a, a quick 60 second review of California Natural Resources Agency, and then a quick sort of hit of the agencies under that, uh, the departments under that umbrella that the money will flow through, and then any of the other bodies that that money will flow to us. So starting now. <laughs> Well, so you have the you have the, the the natural resources agency, and they have grant programs. You've got the wildlife conservation board. You've got the Department of Fish and Wildlife. You've got the Department of Water Resources. You have um, well outside of um, this area, but you have other conservancies, other state conservancies. You have the Coastal Conservancy. Um, Cal Fire has the Forest Legacy Program, which does have. Uh, acquisition. So there's a lot of programs that are out there at the state level um, that provide funding um, to implement 30 by 30. The question will be, you know, how much money will be flowing to those programs for how long? Because um, in previously, we've seen that conservation can be a little bit of a feast or famine uh, kind of uh, thing. <laughs> Well, thank you both again for such an informative evening and um, thank you all to the folks who've uh, joined in and asked such penetrating and enlightening questions. And uh, thanks to our team for the production um, of making this possible. And have a great evening and don't forget your local land trust is making 30 by 30 possible in, in Sonoma County. So don't forget to include us in your thoughts and as you write your checks. 
So thank you all. Take care and have a great night. Um, Bye-bye.